Hello, and welcome to devlog number 28. We're less than two days from the release of the OSP update at this point. I had planned to do this devlog uh, more than a week ago, but there was just so much left on my task list that I really had to focus on getting all of that done so that the update would actually be complete when we reach the release date. But I do want to make sure that I get a devlog out before the update actually hits the public, and aside from some minor balance changes that might still happen between now and release, most of what we're doing is things like missing icons, description blocks, nicknames for weapons, etc. First, I want to give a really big thanks to all of our testers. They've been playing at least four games a day, usually more, for the last two months, which is absolutely insane, and their feedback has been invaluable. Could not have done this without them. I've been looking forward to doing this devlog, but I've also really been dreading it, which is another reason that I've been putting it off till right before release. There are probably a lot of people who wonder why I don't show stuff that's in progress off as often as I used to in the pre-alpha days, and the reason for that is that back then, I had like 50 followers and most of them were other game developers and it was just fun to throw up work in progress stuff, hey look at what I'm working on. But now that we have an audience in the tens of thousands, the things that I say and the things that I show off have an impact and an expectation for those players. But the nature of game development and testing and iteration means that sometimes the stuff you show off doesn't make it into the final build and then people can get disappointed. Before you start to worry, no, I'm not talking about containers, because I know some people were wondering that since they weren't mentioned in the last devlog. Those are in the final release, and they are a ton of fun, and we'll talk about them in a minute. What I am talking about here is Railgun Interception. When I showed the Railgun Interception off in the last devlog, it made a lot of people really excited, and it also made a lot of people really angry. So now that I've pissed off everybody, why? Regardless of some negative public reaction, even the most nitpicky of the testers actually really liked the feature. It wasn't the realism that bothered me. There's plenty of unrealistic things in this game that are done for gameplay's sake. It wasn't the public reaction to it. I've had people say all kinds of horrible things about me in the past, and it doesn't really matter. What was constantly at the back of my mind was the inconsistency of it, and the fact that it was this one perverse exception to the otherwise pretty consistent rules of the game. I had been stewing basically non-stop over rails in the months since the last devlog, wondering if it was the right move for the game. And then this one post in the general discussion channel, not even balanced discussion, which is where most of my woes come from, just crystallized all of my emotion on it at once. I knew that if the feature was going to be cut, it would have to be done before the second wave of testers came in, so I went to the test channels, laid a 10 paragraph post on all of my testers, went to bed and woke up to 400 unread messages. Range is a key part of the identity of Rails, and so what we ended up doing was turning them into a weapon system that can tip the balance of an engagement from across the map, not by doing direct damage, but by dragging down the effectiveness of the enemy ships. We took all of the debuffs in the game, cranked their impact up by two or three times, added a couple new ones, and then added some new UI so it's very obvious to the person on the receiving end that they're being debuffed in different ways. If two equally matched ships are fighting, rails can, for example, cut the fire rate of the enemy ship in half, or start a bunch of fires which have also had their impact significantly increased. I know people are probably tired of hearing about rails, I'm certainly tired of talking about them and hearing about them all the time. But given their prevalence in balanced discussions and in the last devlog, I thought it was important that I correct the record on that. It's a tough thing to do to admit you were wrong to thousands of people, but this is my mea culpa and I hope you'll accept it. With that out of the way, let's talk about fun stuff, which is everything else in the update. Let's start by talking about some non-OSP related stuff. The press embargo has been lifted for a couple days now, which is funny to think about, I never thought I'd have one of those. Uh, so there's been a lot of videos coming out by various YouTubers, which are really great, and I'm thankful for those guys that have talked about a lot of the stuff coming up in the update, but I want to talk about a couple things that they haven't mentioned. The first and most important one is performance. I'm well aware that the performance of the game is less than optimal in a number of scenarios, but fortunately, pretty much everyone should see major performance increases with the release of this update. For example, one of the most egregious scenarios put together by one of our testers, which dragged the game down to 6 frames per second, after the optimizations now jumped immediately up to a buttery smooth 60 frames per second. It was actually a little disorienting at first because I'd never seen the game run at that frame rate before. You should no longer experience slowdowns and frame drops with lots of ships on screen, or when looking at areas of space that have enemy ships that you can't even see. I also reduced a lot of the unnecessary load with missiles so that their average processing time per missile is about 70% faster now. For an example of that, when a couple of testers were working with me to try to replicate a weird freezing scenario, we had four container liners all dumping all of their container missiles at four fleets of Vauxhalls with defenders, and we didn't even hit time dilation despite 100 missiles being in flight. Additionally, these performance improvements may decrease the prevalence of disconnects that people experience in multiplayer. 
The reason for most of the disconnects is that as frame time increases, there has to be more physics fixed updates done in that given frame, and Nebulous does most of its processing in the fixed update in order to keep things consistent. When lots of fixed updates are happening, lots of network traffic gets queued up to be sent and can't actually be transmitted until the end of the rendered frame. If that transmit buffer gets filled up before it can be purged, the socket will automatically be disconnected. By significantly reducing our processing time and our frame time, this should alleviate a lot of these disconnects. There's still lots more optimization to be done, particularly on the network side, but this is a pretty big first step. In the last devlog, I talked about some point defense improvements, including the improved lead solver, as well as the ability for point defense turrets to automatically retask in the same frame that they destroy their target. So that reduces a lot of ammo consumption and basically increases effective PD depth. There's also been some other PD improvements made since then. For example, the Stonewall got a pretty big buff in the form of a new targeting mode where it will fire a full burst at a target and then switch to a new target so it doesn't have to wait for its shells to arrive and waste a bunch of ammo shooting at it. This new tracking mode also opened up the door for an interesting buff to the Sarissa where it now has a three round burst that it will do the same thing where it will fire at a single target and then immediately switch to a new target which has improved its effectiveness quite a bit. And finally, and most interestingly, the PD controller now has the ability to task any unused fire control radars that have not been ordered by the player, as well as if you have any AMMs in flight, it'll automatically take any untasked eliminators and shine them on those AMMs targets, so that makes it much easier to use semi-active AMMs. Next up, we've got some missile changes that I think will be really welcome. First, and probably the most impactful change, is that validator seekers now assume the field of view and range of whatever the primary seeker is. This means you no longer have to worry about cone compatibility between the primary and the validator seeker, and it makes them a lot easier to use and build. Validators have also had their reliability logic changed so that instead of doing a roll every time the seeker tried to acquire a target, which could result in some really weird probabilities working out, they now do one roll on launch, which determines whether the validator will be reliable or not, and then the probabilities that you see in the stat card are actually the probabilities that you get. With the significant improvements to PD effectiveness and targeting, for example, a defender will now shoot down an incoming hybrid if it's going in a straight line. I made terminal maneuvers a lot more effective. I tightened up the weave and the corkscrew so that they don't have a really high probability of just shooting off into space and missing the target completely anymore. And I was really happy to see that on the test branch, terminal maneuvers, specifically the corkscrew, are really common now. The only change that I think won't be welcome for missiles is that I fixed a bug in the blast fragmentation warhead where it wasn't actually scaling by the warhead weight, so AMMs were doing more damage than they should be doing. In order to compensate for this a little bit, the SGM-1 got one extra slot in its engine warhead trade-off slider to give you a little bit extra damage, but I would still recommend that you check all of your AMMs. And finally, one more bug fix that has huge balance implications is that the thruster power bug has been fixed. What this means is that ships no longer have a uniform linear motor in all directions. It varies now depending on whether you're using translation thrusters or braking thrusters or main engines, and ships will change their acceleration based on the direction that they're actually thrusting in. When it comes to the impact on ships, their maneuverability in non-forward directions is going to be reduced a little bit. Uh, for the Alliance ships, they have pretty high translation thruster power because they're warships and they're built for speed. But when it comes to the OSP ships, they're going to be a lot more sluggish moving in different directions than just accelerating forward. The next section of the video is going to be about the OSP faction, but I'm not really going to talk about their equipment because, as I said before, there's plenty of other videos coming out showing off all those things, and I talked about a lot of them in the last devlog. But what this is really going to be is talking about the process we went through balancing the faction and the challenges that we ran into. Please do note, though, with those videos that some of the values that you're seeing in them may not be the final values on release. To be straight up about it, balancing the OSP faction was very difficult. I really do care a lot about balance. I wouldn't let railguns keep me up at night if I didn't care about it. I care about balance because while there are plenty of players who just want to fire the game up and watch spaceships explode, there are a lot of players who play very competitively and balance matters to them and I want them to have fun in the game. When we built the original faction, the Alliance, we did it gradually one ship at a time, adding modules here and there, making hundreds of balance changes over the two year pre-alpha period. With the OSP, on the other hand, we did the entire faction at once and were really only able to start doing balance testing about two months ago. And in just those two months, we made the same hundreds of balance adjustments that we did over the two-year period for the Alliance. 
The design space for the faction is frankly huge, and there's so much that you can do with it. The testers have done an incredible job, and I'm so thankful for them, but there are certainly things that they didn't try, that the public is going to try, that we may not have thought of. The interesting thing about the OSP is that they're kind of a hard faction to learn to play. They have a lot of unique weaknesses, and in the early days, they were getting crushed in a lot of the games, and so we kept buffing them, trying to account for those weaknesses. Basically, in the early days, the only time the OSP ever won was when they either played exceptionally well or when the Alliance made a grievous mistake. And then, after all these buffs, once the players learned what they needed to do in order to take advantage of the faction's strengths and overcome their weaknesses, the scales completely flipped to the point where the OSP was winning basically every game. We've toned them down quite a bit since then, and I think we're at a pretty good point where the odds are roughly even. Generally, the OSP has a really good cap game. They have incredible mass because their ships are so cheap and they can bring a lot of them. The Alliance absolutely cannot be complacent in the cap game, and they need to basically have constant awareness of what's going on and what caps they're losing or gaining. Nebulous has never been forgiving of mistakes, and that's kind of one of the things I think people really like about the game, that your actions really have consequences, but that is even more true now. I also want to explicitly state that part of the mandate for testing was that we were testing OSP versus Alliance, and that's it. We did not test mixed teams. The game is not balanced for mixed teams. The reason for that is that each faction has unique strengths and weaknesses, and putting them on the same team would nullify those weaknesses, and that would produce very strange balance results. Because of that, lobbies by default enforce uniform factions across a team, although that option can be disabled by the lobby host. First up on the list of balanced topics, because this is nebulous, is obviously sensors. The OSP's sensors are both their greatest weakness and their greatest strength. The general purpose search and track radars that the OSP has on their ships are civilian models. They don't have the same capabilities or the features of military ones. They're very susceptible to jamming. They don't have burn through capability. So how do we make that thematic and matching the faction, but not be overbearing from a gameplay perspective? The early warning radar is neat in that it can tell you roughly where the enemy is, but it gives you really poor track quality. You definitely can't shoot at that 150 to 200 meter inaccuracy. But the ability to have those orderable sensors creates really unique sensor gameplay that's specific to this faction, and we wanted to kind of go further on that. So instead of just giving the OSP better electronic protect capabilities, which is boring, we made the R400, which is that radar you saw in the trailer that some people were asking about, the big dish on the front of the tug. What it does is it kind of creates the ultimate offset scout and has a very narrow beam that allows you to track one specific target and get really good track quality on it and then forward that track information to the actual shooting ship. Next, we've got line ships, which in my opinion are the most fun part of the patch. They're really unique and really fun to use, but they were also probably the most pre-buffed part of the faction. And the reason for that was I thought players were really going to struggle with the difficulty of getting the casemates on target. But a skilled line ship player who knows how to preface their guns can really do a lot of damage and they were very hard to kill, so we had to tone them down quite a bit. They still have a lot of survivability simply due to their massive volume tank, and we may need to continue to tone them down a little bit more, but they are just the most unique part of this patch, I think. The container liner, on the other hand, had to actually be toned up quite a bit. I'm really happy that we were able to get the container ships into a good spot. I was really worried that they were such a cool idea, but I was really worried that they weren't going to work out. But they did turn out to be really fun. If you're good at yub nubbing, they're an excellent way to exert lots of pressure on the Alliance early on in the game, while also still not being that overbearing because of the simple size of the containers and how easy of a target they are, it's pretty hard to get them through a well-developed PD net. The most interesting thing that we had to do in order to get containers to be in a good spot was we actually gave them a 50% discount on any seeker and support module that goes in there because otherwise, with the number of them that you can carry, it pretty much made it so that if you wanted to fully fill a ship, the only way to do it was with absolute minimum cost uh, SAR H missiles. But the discount makes it so that there's a lot of build diversity available for container missiles, while also not being overbearing with the more advanced seekers and support modules simply because of what an easy PD target they are. Eventually, the container liner is going to be the OSP's carrier because the container banks provide large open areas that can be used for flight decks. But carriers are a long way off, and we wanted to make sure that the container liner wasn't just a one-trick pony where its only capability was long-range firepower delivery, so we created a couple of utilities for it. One of these is its ability to deploy mines forward using a mine container that will fly to an area and deploy two mines without having to actually fly a ship there. The other capability, which is by far my favorite, is deception in the form of decoy containers. 
These are containers that mimic the electronic signature and the speed of a specific type of ship, and you can send them on waypoint paths around the map to confuse the enemy. This can be really effective when deployed properly, and it's very funny to watch the Alliance teams debating in voice like, is it real? I don't know, and then wasting six hybrids on a cargo container. Rockets. So rockets are the OSP's version of beams. They're high alpha damage at close range, high risk, high reward. The problem we ran into with the rockets is that they're so cheap and the platform you can mount them, aka shuttles, is so cheap that basically you could bring a fully kitted Acelo in your fleet as well as nine rocket shuttles. This meant that it was really easy to get a lot of tries. So that high risk kind of became more of a medium risk because you could just do it over and over again until you got it right. There was also the abomination of the double rocket line ship that I brought in the video that you're seeing where I had almost 650 rockets available to me. So obviously the cost of rockets had to go up a little bit in order to reduce the number of tries that you would get. But actually the biggest problem with rockets was not really their cost, it was a number of issues with doing damage to small ships that had to be corrected in order to make those small ships actually die as fast as they need to. One of these issues was with how HE shells work. So when an HE shell hits a ship, it'll pick a random distance between the impact point and the maximum penetration depth in order to actually do its explosion. However, on very small ships, it was possible that a lot of the time, about 50% sometimes with the shuttle, that explosion distance would actually occur outside the hull of the ship, and so the shell would do zero damage. So now HE shells have the position that they'll do their explosion at capped inside the hull, so that can't happen anymore. Additionally, there was an issue with RPF where due to its low armor penetration, the amount of distance that it would actually search into the hull in order to find a component to damage was very short, so I added an override to that so that it will always search a uh, significant distance to try to find components. All in all, those two changes made the weapons that are meant to deal with small ships a lot more effective against small ships and made rocket shuttle swarms a lot more of a risky proposition. One of the things we ran into on the Alliance side was that Alliance players were actually really reluctant to be bringing capital ships. When you think about it from a lore perspective, the sword that's really hanging over the Protectorate's head is the Alliance's capital ships, and so it makes sense that they would focus their design efforts on anything they could to counter those. That leaves Alliance capitals facing an entire faction that's designed to kill them and not small ships, but we don't really want every AN player to only be able to play frigate swarms or they'll just lose to the OSP every time. So in order to buff the larger ships, we added the Mark 65 triple barrel 250 millimeter cannon, as well as increasing the damage that 250 millimeter rounds do. That allowed these large ships to carry weapons that are not meant for punching in their own weight class, and they're actually able to hit down a little better now. The biggest deterrent to Alliance Capitals is the plasma and 100 millimeter combination, especially when you take into account the addition of the new 100 millimeter round, which is an HEHC, that's high explosive, high capacity, which is a high explosive round that doesn't have a lot of armor penetration but has a ton of explosive power. When you fire that through holes in the armor that have been created by plasma, it's devastatingly effective. So we turned down the plasma damage a little bit where previously it was guaranteed to go through any kind of armor. We made it low enough that it'll take multiple hits to the same spot to actually get through a battleship's armor, as well as it's slow enough that uh, with the proper drive set and playing nebulous drift command properly, you can dodge a lot of it. And finally, mines. So for some reason, a lot of people were under the impression that I was vehemently against adding mines to the game, and I don't know where anyone got that from because I've never commented on mines before. But every time, without fail, it would come up in our suggestion channels, the person who suggested it would get flamed by like 10 people. Mines are a huge deal in modern naval warfare. They're an excellent way for a less capable navy to exert territory control, even if they don't have the ships to do it, and it's perfectly fitting for the OSP to have access to them. They allowed the OSP to exert additional map control even if they're not able to stand up in certain fights. They can hold their cap points longer uh, and resist Alliance back caps. But doing mines right meant making them risky for the team using them as well. The way mines work is that they listen to the ship's transponder, which only works if its comms are on and its antenna is intact. I've seen a numerous times where OSP ships have been in the middle of a friendly minefield and had their antenna shot off by enemy fire, and then they just get obliterated by that minefield. They took a lot of careful tuning in order to get right, but I think they're in a pretty good place right now. No one seems to be too frustrated playing against them, and they add a lot of new interesting gameplay dynamics. All of this is to say that balancing this faction was really hard. We spent a year in pre-alpha balancing the Alliance faction, and there were still more changes that needed to be done once we released, and there will be more changes that need to be done to the OSP once we release them to the public and we find out how the public plays with it. But thanks to the efforts of the testers, 
the balance is in a really good spot, even if the inevitable tweak here and there will need to be made in the future. As is tradition, we'll wrap up this devlog by talking about what's coming in the future. The big news is that on the side of developing the OSP, I also did an experimental build of a dedicated server for Nebulous, and it was successful. Right now, I am capable of running it on my own computer and connecting two clients to it and playing a game and getting to the battle report. However, there's still a lot more to do, so this is going to take me a little bit to finish, but it is a pretty major step and something that I definitely want to get out as soon as possible. We'd also like to start getting some additional maps into the game because now that Stefmo is no longer focused on making OSP ships constantly, he's going to have plenty of time to do modeling work like that. We definitely like to turn the hyperspace gate that we used for the trailer into an actual playable map, although it is absolutely not optimized for gameplay right now. But that, along with some other ideas that we have, will hopefully add to the map repertoire and make it so that not everybody is only playing pillars. On top of that, I've also got some plans for a minor update that'll add some additional missile-related features such as mixed salvos and multiple salvo planning and simultaneous time on target. But the big news, of course, is major update number three, Conquest. I gave a preview of it a couple devlogs ago, but I was so focused on getting the OSP finished and there turned out to be a lot more development work on my side than I had anticipated, so I haven't made any more progress on that. But now that OSP is done, I'm able to shift my effort back over to Conquest and get the ball really rolling on that. I debated whether I wanted to include this or not, but I want to wrap up this devlog with being real with y'all for a minute. Nebulous has been out in early access for a year. In that time, we've done two major updates and 15 minor updates, which is a lot for any studio, but particularly for a studio that only has four people, all of whom are working part-time. In order to make that happen, I have had to drive the team hard. My own schedule looks like get up and go to work, come home from work, work on Nebulous, go to bed, and repeat that every day for a year. I do it because I love this game and I believe in this game, and I love how people love the game and the joy that it brings them, but if we're to finish this game without dying in the process, it's time to put the brakes on a little bit. As I've said before, Conquest is going to be building a second game on top of the existing game, and that means that it has to be a marathon and not a sprint the way these last two major updates have been. This will probably be the last devlog for a little while, because what needs to be done for Conquest in order to make sure it's done right is not really the kind of stuff that really can get shown in a devlog. There's lots of design documents to create, task lists to build, to make sure that we know exactly what the scope of the project is going to be and to plan accordingly. And then once all that's done and we actually move on to development of the update in earnest, there's going to be a couple months of nitty gritty under the hood work, setting the framework and laying the groundwork necessary to make the update actually function before we can even get to gameplay. The Conquest update is what I'm most excited for in the game and I think a lot of people are as excited as I am. But I hope that in the meantime, the massive infusion of content that the Protectorate update represents is enough to keep people engaged and entertained for the time being, and that you'll bear with us in the meantime, because we're here for the long haul, and I hope that you are too. That's it for this update. Thank you for watching.